Being a historically great NBA team is very difficult, but being a historically bad NBA team is just as difficult. Much like how good teams need to be in the right place at the right time, bad teams need the opposite. They need anything and everything to go wrong for them. And fortunately, most teams throughout NBA history have avoided this tragic outcome. A few teams, however, weren't as lucky and were unable to get out of their own way. Up until about a decade ago, the least winningest teams of all time were the 1993 Dallas Mavericks and the 1998 Denver Nuggets, both of whom finished with records of 11 and 71, which works out to a winning percentage of 13.4%. However, the fewest wins in NBA history belonged to the 1999 Vancouver Grizzlies, an expansion team who won just eight games in their fourth season, which just so happened to be lockout shortened. Both of those records stood until 2011, 2012. We had another truncated NBA season. This time it was shortened to just 66 games and the Charlotte Bobcats would shatter both of those records after going just seven and 59, which was a winning percentage of 10.6. I did my best to find some writings, some quotes, some features on this team, but the writings, the writings on the internet are incredibly sparse. Now, do you guys understand how incredibly atrocious you have to be to have zero redeeming qualities, like nothing, nothing good anyone has anything to say about you? Even the 0-16 Detroit Lions at least had Calvin Johnson who led the league in receiving touchdowns that year and was fifth in receiving yards, but yet, I digress. What's strange about Charlotte's record-setting season is that it seemingly came out of nowhere. They were coming off a season where they finished 34 and 48, a mark that was not great, but at least somewhat respectable, albeit it would have been significantly worse if Larry Brown hadn't been replaced after starting nine and 19. The tragedy of the 2011-2012 Charlotte Bobcats is a four-layer cake. You had mismanagement in the front office, a severe lack of talent, a host of injuries, and the icing, the cake topper. Just bad luck. Straight up bad luck. Charlotte began their downward trend in February of 2011, months before the tip-off of their now infamous campaign. General Manager Rod Higgins offloaded 28-year-old Gerald Wallace, sending him to the Portland Trail Blazers for Dante Cunningham, Sean Marks, Joel Prisbilla, Cash, and two first round draft picks, which would go on to select Tobias Harris in 2011 and Shabazz Napier in 2014. Up until being traded, Wallace was one of Charlotte's more reliable options. He averaged about 16 points a night on 45% shooting, but could get up to 18 or even 20 or 22 if the night really called for it. Additionally, he was a stellar rebounder and one of the league's most disruptive and impactful defenders. In the summer of 2011, Charlotte replaced Higgins with Rich Cho, whose first order of business was drafting Kemba Walker and Tobias Harris in the first round of the 2011 draft. On draft night, however, Cho facilitated a three-team deal. It sent Harris, Sean Livingston, and Steven Jackson to Milwaukee. In return, Charlotte received Corey Maggette from the Bucks and then Bismack Biombo from the Sacramento Kings. To this day, it's still unclear as to what possessed Cho to trade away Tobias Harris, especially considering he appeared to be a quality, talented young player and teams when they're trying to rebuild usually want to stockpile quality and talented young players. Trading Jackson and Wallace did significantly more harm than good. Admittedly, both guys deteriorated after leaving Charlotte, but in the years leading up to their trades, they posted impressive numbers and you would expect that the team would get at least something in return, or at least guys who would wind up suiting up for the organization. The Wallace trade was particularly egregious in this regard because neither Cunningham, nor Sean Marks, nor Joel Prisbilla even played for Charlotte. They traded their second best player for almost nothing. Nothing. Getting Corey Maggette in return for Steven Jackson was better, but we're gonna get to that in just a little bit. Compounding matters was that Charlotte did almost nothing 
in free agency. And I understand that it's increasingly difficult for small and medium market teams and bad ones at that to attract premier free agents to their location. However, to not even bring in a decent player, not even someone who is contributing double digit points like 12, 13, 14, 15 points, that is missing the mark by 100 meters in whatever direction. When it was all said and done, Charlotte's most impressive free agent signing was Derek Brown, who averaged 8.1 points. Heading into the now infamous season, Charlotte's lack of talent was striking, and most of it was the result of the front office just fumbling the offseason. No one expected them to become a contender, but at least construct a competitive roster. The Bobcats were consistently getting blown out by more than 25 points, and their 16 losses by that margin remain the most in NBA history. Charlotte's most noticeable shortcoming was their lack of a dynamic score. There wasn't anybody on the team who could single-handedly take over a game and just will the team to victory. As a result, they finished with an average of 87 points a night and an offensive rating of 95.2, both of which were last in the league. Gerald Henderson wound up being the team's go-to guy. And it wasn't that Henderson was a bad player, but the 24-year-old was ill-equipped for the role that he was forced into. Despite being a terrific slasher and an excellent finisher around the basket, Henderson's skill set just wasn't good enough to be that of a number one option. He wasn't that versatile of a scorer, and thanks to his lackluster supporting cast, the defense could just send endless waves of pressure his way because they weren't worried about anybody else beating them. In short, Gerald Henderson was a good young player who was set up to fail. And that's the case with a lot of these guys on this Bobcats team. Kemba Walker's struggles were just as noticeable as anybody else's. Walker was a rookie at the time, but he still averaged about 12 points on less than 40% shooting, a far cry from the type of player that he has since turned into. Corey Maggette proved to be the second most reliable option on the team. He barely trailed Henderson in scoring at 15 a night, but really just had immense struggles putting the ball in the basket inside the three-point line. He shot just 37.5% on twos, and a lot of his inconsistency can be traced back to the fact that he missed about half the season due to injuries. Things got so bad that Paul Silas had to go deep into the dark trenches of his idea bag, just looking for any combination of guys that would breathe the slightest bit of life into his team. According to Basketball Reference, 16 players suited up with the Bobcats that season. Only one of them appeared in fewer than 20 games, and that was Jamario Moon. Moreover, Silas wasn't afraid to give everybody extended playing time. Everybody on the roster played more than 10 minutes a night, which is a miraculous feat considering how <laughs> badly things can go off the rails when you deploy anybody beyond the second string. Charlotte, of course, had nothing to lose, and Silas went on to use 24 different starting lineups in 66 games. Thanks to the lockout, nobody was sure of when or if training camps and the preseason would begin. As you could expect, this would cause conditioning issues for the guys who couldn't take it into their own hands. And I don't remember how widespread this problem was, but I do remember it being a little bit of an issue. Some teams got hit with the injury bug harder than others, and that's a thing that happens every year, without a doubt. But having to play yourself into shape during the regular season certainly wasn't doing anybody any favors. Of course, another variable in that equation is just bad timing. And Charlotte, of course, got hit with the bad timing hard. As I mentioned, Cormaghetti missed about half the season with hamstring, Achilles, and lower back ailments. Reggie Williams, one of Charlotte's most notable free agent signings, missed the first 21 games of the season recovering from meniscus surgery. Williams later on missed a handful of games at the end of the regular season and in total missed about the same amount of time as Corey Maggette did. Gerald Henderson and DJ Augustine also missed some time as well, albeit it wasn't as serious as the other guys with Henderson being out for only 11 games and Augustine missing 18 in total. 
Kemba Walker was the only guy to appear in every game that season. And Mullins, Biombo, and Derek Brown missed just five combined games between the three of them. While injuries didn't cause all of the Bobcats' grief, it certainly contributed to the discombobulated state of the franchise. But one thing that I found very interesting was that Charlotte's talent deficit was exacerbated by the league-wide talent deficit. Collectively, teams posted a scoring average of 96.3 points per game, the sixth lowest mark in the three-point era. Teams weren't all that efficient either, posting a piddling shooting percentage of 44.8%. Those numbers are comparable to the early 2000s when there was this weird transition between guys like Michael Jordan, Carl Malone, and John Stockton, and the rise of guys like LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, and Dwayne Wade. Of course, there were stars in the early 2000s, guys like Shaq, guys like Allen Iverson, but overall, there was a shift in how teams played, and there was much more of an emphasis put on defense. And it wasn't a change that people wanted to make, it was a change that coaches had to make. Nowadays, NBA fans are spoiled. The league is the most talented that it's ever been from top to bottom. It's the most collective talent the NBA has ever seen. A result of this influx of talent is an offensive boom and records being shattered at a rapid pace. In each of the last three seasons, the league has set a new benchmark in nightly scoring and the shooting clip has been above 46% in each of those years. A similar trend happened in the mid 80s and throughout the 90s when guys like Charles Barkley, John Stockton, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan came into the league. The talent drought of the mid to late 2000s is attributed to the combination of older stars retiring and weak draft classes coming in. Outside of Kevin Durant, Kevin Love, and Russell Westbrook, the 2006 to 2008 draft classes are some of the most forgettable ones in NBA history, and those guys would have began peaking around 2011. Charlotte didn't have access to any pieces that would have made their team significantly better. Of course, they also didn't do themselves any favors. The front office mismanaged a lot of free agency and made a couple of suspect trades. The outcome was an unforgettable season in all of the worst ways. And I don't know if we'll ever see an NBA team be that bad. As always, thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me. If this is your first time, welcome. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back. Everything I'm associated with is in the description down below. If you could also give the video a like, if you liked it, a dislike, if you didn't like it and subscribe and hit the notification bell to see more content just like this. As always, your support is very appreciated and I'll catch you guys in the next one.